prompt lecture on the freedom of the press given this evening by Nobel Peace Prize winner, Maria Reza. Free speech, enshrined in the Bill of Rights, defended by generations of patriots, exalted and extolled by generations of journalists, now represents both a treasure and a trap. A treasure because free speech fuels innovation and invention and broad intellectual inclusion, but a trap when cynics hide behind its protections to do all manner of harm. Freedom of speech, in other words, is not a layup, which is why this annual lecture has never mattered more. It was named for former CBS News President Richard Salant, a longtime broadcaster and staunch advocate for press freedom, and was endowed by the estate of Dr. Frank Stanton, another longtime CBS News president, to bring leading journalists and scholars and legal practitioners to Harvard and help us wrestle with big, hard questions. Have we a democratic duty to defend even anti-democratic speech? Does a love of free speech protect hate speech? And tonight's topic, what would you sacrifice for the truth? Because when information itself becomes a battlefield, how long before truth becomes a casualty? I can't imagine at this moment a better guide to these hard questions than Maria Reza, who is with us at the Kennedy School as a Hauser Fellow at the Center for Public Leadership and a Joan Shorenstein Fellow at the Shorenstein Center. And I want to thank CPL Director Hannah Riley Bowles and Executive Director Ken Himmelman for co-sponsoring Maria's fellowship and helping make it possible for her to be here on campus with us, bringing such richness to our conversations in and out of the classroom with students and faculty and fellows and staff. Here to introduce our guest and moderate this evening's discussion is my colleague, Latanya Sweeney, the Daniel Paul Professor of the Practice of Government and Technology at Harvard Kennedy School and Harvard University. Dr. Sweeney directs the Public Interest Tech Lab at the Shorenstein Center and is a pioneer in creating and using technology to address problems facing free societies. Through the Tech Lab and her teaching and other research, she's helping the next generation of leaders better understand and prepare for the challenges and opportunities that technology presents. Latanya Sweeney. Oh, thank you, Nancy. And a warm welcome to everyone joining us tonight in our virtual audience. It is my extreme honor and privilege to introduce this year's Ceylon lecturer, Maria Ressa. I can think of no one, no person better to speak about press freedom than Maria. She was named as a recipient of the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize just a few weeks ago, deservedly for her fearless defense of freedom of expression and her tireless commitment to exposing abuses of power by the Duterte regime in her native country, the Philippines. A journalist in Asia for 35 years, Maria Ressa co-founded Rappler.com, the Philippines' top independent news outlet. Under Maria's leadership, Rappler's team of investigative journalists has been relentless in their coverage of Duterte's deadly drug war. As Rappler's CEO and president, Maria has endured constant political harassment and arrest in the real world by the Duterte government and its use of information warfare online. Despite countless attempts to silence her, Maria's voice has only grown louder, clearer, and more powerful. She has emerged as a bold leader in the fight for press freedom in the Philippines and around the world. And she continues to expose the critical role social media can play in the erosion of facts and public discourse, freedom of the press and democracy. A former CNN bureau chief and time person of the year, Maria joins us tonight from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she is currently serving as a Shorenstein Center fellow and a Hauser leader at the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome, Maria Ressa. Thank you, thank you for having me. It is, it's been amazing to be on campus. And yesterday I was just with Latanya's class and it was, 
it was incredible. The ideas that were going through it. So I, I will dump in uh, maybe, you know, ideas from the last five years, uh, data from the last five years. I always joke that, you know, I feel like um, a combination of Sisyphus and Cassandra. Um, but you're listening to me now. So thank you for, <laughs> for everyone there. Um, let me let me put it this way from what Nancy said, you know, this this is a freedom of speech. The Salant lecture is about freedom of speech. But what happens if the world turns upside down and freedom of speech is used to stifle freedom of speech? That's really what's happening what is happening right now and you know let me let me share with you uh the presentation um you know the, i think that i'm going to lay out just a few things why should you care about the philippines why does it even matter to you think of us as like fruit flies drosophila which is you know the reason why genetic researchers uh experiment on drosophila is because uh they have they they move they live and die quickly i hate to point it that way but you know it's like you can have four generations in the time that it takes you know less than one generation and then you can experiment and see it through well that's exactly what the philippines became and this is from cambridge analytica whistleblower chris wiley he said that cambridge analytica as well as its parent company scl had been operating in the philippines trying tactics of mass manipulation on filipinos uh and that if it worked on us then they the word he used was ported it over to the West, you know, for, I mean, the real target, of course, were Americans in the 2016 presidential elections that you have. Let me let me start it here then. Um, sorry, let's just here's what we'll cover in the next 20 to 30 minutes. You know, what social media has done is really turn it atomized meaning. And that's really difficult for journalists because we came at it of, you know, we try to give you meaning, but what happens when it's atomized? And it now becomes a man to man, woman to woman defense of our values and our democracy. That is the world we live in. What I hope to do in this is to show you what happened how it changed us, what kind of emergent human behavior it is, you know, it is building, you know, and, and then after all of this destruction, how do we create the future? What can we do? And the question I'd like you to think about, because when it becomes a person-to-person -person defense of democracy, the question for you is, what are you willing to sacrifice for the truth, because that is the kind of moment we're living in right now. Um, you know, I always, it, the last time a working journalist got this Peace Prize was in 1936, right before um, World War II, and he languished in a Nazi concentration camp. So the Nobel Committee essentially said, you know, here we are, we're, sp we're spotlighting journalists. We are walking into another potential uh, rise of fascism. I don't even know what to call it. This is what happened in 2014. I'll peg it to that year. When the atom bomb exploded, um, we all knew what happened. 70,000 people died instantaneously. But in 2014, an invisible atom bomb exploded in the global information ecosystem, forever changing it, but insidiously manipulating us. And we don't know that it happened. So here's the lesson from the Philippines. Uh, and why we were so certain. Um, part of it is because we created Rappler on, on Facebook first, right? Uh, in 2011, if Facebook had had better search, we would have, we would have probably not created our own website. But in, by 2017, I was one of 12 researchers working on a project that didn't really see the light of day. Um, uh, the head of the project, Camille Francois, who now heads Graphica, 
coined the term patriotic trolling. And that to me, when we were looking at it all across the world, um, was this rise that was particularly attacking women. But it is, here's the definition, state-sponsored online hate and harassment campaigns that's meant to silence and intimidate, right? Flood the market with lies, with disinformation. And think about it like this, right? If information is power, disinformation is abuse of power. Uh, women were a favorite easy target across uh, many of these different countries that we were operating from. Uh, in the Philippines, our data showed us that women were being attacked at least 10 times more than men. There's three steps, and this is, I'm, I'm taking you back to 2016. The three steps, and, and I would say, you know, I was a cautionary tale, the target for journalists. Our politician, the target there is Senator Lila de Lima. She's been in prison since February 2017. And then there was a businessman target. He, President Duterte, named him in, uh, in the podium in a nationwide broadcast and his company lost. Uh, it was a publicly listed company, was forced to sell. So the three steps, and it's the same in every country, attack the credibility, allege corruption, even if there's none, you know, this is gaslighting to the nth degree, and then you repeat it. And one of the things we've learned is that when you say a lie a million times, it becomes a fact. People believe it. This is the age of social media, right? And in, in Mark Twain's time, you, you can, truth can catch up. Uh, uh, and now there's, it literally changes our reality. So facts, no more facts. The second is the second tactic used against this is sexual violence. And I'll show you the example that happened to me. You inflame the biases, uh, fuel misogyny. You degrade the target as a sexual object. And then you will be surprised how many real people jump on that bandwagon. And then finally, the last one in Lila de Lima's case, uh, they trended two weeks before she was arrested in February 2017. Uh, the propaganda machine, which we exposed, trended hashtag arrest Lila de Lima. Then she was arrested in May 2017. That same machine tried to trend hashtag arrest Maria Ressa. It didn't trend. And that's probably why it took them another two weeks, two years before they actually arrested me. Um, here's how we first discovered it. In September of 2016, a bomb exploded in a night market in Davao, which is the, uh, the home base of President Duterte, Rodrigo Duterte. Um, the next day, surprisingly, he, he did a very draconian measure, which to me was a little alarming. He declared a state of emergency. And then uh, shortly after that, um, we found websites running this story. And this was ground zero that we discovered. Um, man with high quality of bomb nabbed at Davao checkpoint, presumably to justify the draconian measure, right? And that's the website. We found it, newstrendph.com. That website has now been taken down. But here's the thing. The bombing was in September, but the R story was March, 2016. And here's the thing. It was amplified on all these Duterte pages. How did we discover it in Rappler? This is why I think the first people who did the in, this information operations were journalists or former journalists because they, um, they linked it to Rappler. So I was just looking at it on, a, on that Friday night going into Saturday morning. I was looking at it, I was like, why is a six month old article number one? You know, it had more traffic than before and that was my introduction, Rappler's introduction to information operations, to information operations used as PR to massage the, in the conditions for government's actions. This was a story we published that included that, Propaganda War, Weaponizing the Internet. It was one of three part series. Um, and the second part, and I'll show you this one, this was our discovery of, you know, then we started looking at the Facebook pages that were attacking journalists because at that time period, soon after Duterte took office, it was really, we experienced exponential attacks. 
This is an example of one of those Facebook pages, Luvimin Kansho, you can see at the top, right? So we Excel, this is an Excel sheet that one of our folks put together. Um, what was interesting about that Facebook page was that this person, this page followed more groups than had friends. So then we looked at the friends of this group and we looked at the photo of her photo. You reverse image scan this, you know, um, you will see that that is the photo of a, a, a Korean pop star. Um, I wouldn't have known, but reverse imaging works. But in, today, in the age of GAN, of AI-generated photos, this is no longer a good tactic, a good discovery. So what did we do? We looked at all of the, the, the accounts that this person was connected to, the friends, and we came. we found 26 accounts. And then we took everything, every single thing that they had said they were, and we fact-checked it. Every single thing on that sheet, where they worked, what they did, where they went to school, where they live, everything there is a lie, right? That is these 26 accounts. These, these are fake accounts, and that's what you would call a sock puppet network. The next step, again, because we're journalists and very traditional in that sense, was to take a look at these 26 fake accounts, that sock puppet network, as they work together, and then count how many other Facebook accounts do they influence. And when we did that, it took us months. But again, before we automated anything, you know, we wanted to do it manually. And we found that these 26 fake accounts influenced at least 3 million other accounts. And this was the story that my co-founder, Chai Hofilenya, who's now our managing editor, uh, this is what she wrote as part of that three-part series, fake accounts, manufactured reality on social media. What were these fake accounts doing? They were tearing down the credibility of news organizations. This was the three-part series in 2016. The third, the third part of that series was, you know, I wrote two of the three parts, how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. When this happened, I was deluged. As soon as we published them, you know, we double checked, triple checked our data. I even went to the board, my board, and told them we were publishing this because I expected a backlash. I did not expect 90, 90 hate messages per hour. When you expose something, you expect that it will come back at you. But I could never have expected this. Um, so then they tried to trend hashtag arrest Maria Aressa. Uh, we did the we did a uh, we published the transcript of a conversation between Presidents Duterte and Trump. This is one of the content creators of the first wave of the propaganda machine. Um, this person became a consultant to our Department of Foreign Affairs, but you know, read it and you can kind of laugh. By publishing the transcript, Rappler made the Philippines a legitimate target of North Korean nuclear missiles. Sounds laughable, right? But imagine that repeated a million times. And then it, it went, it spurred off. Uh, this is on Twitter, because think again, this is the entire information ecosystem, and they work together, info ops, call her to the Senate, ipatawag na yan sa Senado, hashtag arrest Maria Ressa. I can smell an arrest and possible closure of Rappler.com. Um, this was May 25, 2017. You know, I was arrested in 2019. It, it didn't trend, that's why. And here we go to the third part, which is, you know, sexualize, degrade. Maybe Maria Ressa's dream is to become the ultimate porn star in a gangbang scene. It's not. Me to the RP government, make sure Maria Ressa gets publicly raped to death when martial law expands to Luzon. Now, these are real people. So you have the info ops, like a virus of lies released, and then they infect real people. And those real people have a belief change, it changes the way they look at the world, right? So what did we do? We created something we called Shark Tank. Shark Tank, this was a 2016 
Shark Tank. Today, our Shark Tank, our database, it is publicly available posts, right? And all we did was to put them together so we could see the patterns in the data. Um, today, our Shark Tank has nearly 400 million public posts and growing 450 million public comments. And if you look here, I'll show you what it looks like, but these are websites because they they lodge it in the in the end. The end goal is to mimic news websites and make people believe that's the case. These are the Facebook pages spreading the websites. And if it is uh, the if the average reposting is more than ten, it turns red. I'm going to bring you to October 2016, which is when we published the series. Look at how red it became, and I want to show you a Facebook page. Uh, that this is Sally Matai. This has been taken down by Facebook, but look at the cut and paste, right? You can see it. And then to the left, you can see the pages that this account posts in. This is just, mga kadds is just a call to action of Duterte supporters. And then you can see the websites and how many times they post there. Um, and you can see as early as 2016, Sarah Duterte working with Bong Bong Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. This is something we armed our social media group with because they needed to understand the difference between real and fake. Now I'm going to fast forward you to June 15th, 2020. We saw that from 2016, and here we are in 2020. What happened? That, that bottom-up exponential attack, the weaponization of social media, in my case, the, the meta-narrative they seeded is journalist equals criminal. That was coming bottom up. A year later, President Duterte came top down and said the same thing in his State of the Nation address. After that, about a week later, I got my first subpoena. Rappler got its first subpoena. And by January 2018, uh, the government, the Philippine government tried to shut us down, revoking our license to operate. We refused. We, we pushed back. Um, our, I realized later on that, you know, my my co-founder and I did the press conference, but we forgot to tell our lawyer we were going to do that because we were just, you know, this was just so wrong. Um, but then what happened? 2018, 11 cases and investigations. 2019, all the arrests. So it, it took two years. February 2019 was my first arrest, the Valentine's gift of my government. Um, and then uh, my first conviction, June 15, 2020, for a story I didn't write, edit, or supervise, published in 2012, before the law we allegedly violated was in place. And here's the kicker. Um, Rappler was innocent, thank God. But the two of us were guilty. This is on appeal. That methodology, keep it in mind, because I'm going to show you how it also worked for you. But this, this conviction helped show uh, Facebook's dangers, right? These algorithms that make you doubt reality when social media becomes a behavior modification system that essentially uh, it turns us into Pavlov's dogs, these experimentation where research has shown as early as 2018 that lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further on social media. Okay, so if you have lies, meaning you don't have facts, if you don't have facts, how can you have truth? How can you have trust? If you don't have these three, you don't have democracy, you don't have a shared reality, okay? This is the world we live in today. How can you solve any of the problems, the existential problems we face? I'll bring it to you here in the United States. This is um, uh, the January 6th this year uh, when Silicon Valley since came home to roost. This timeline is from the US-based Election Integrity Partnership. And you can see the same thing happening on that election fraud meta narrative. In August 2019, it was seeded uh, August 20th on RT. And then da and Steve Bannon picks it up on August 11th on YouTube. And that is seeded on closed pages. Then you have Fox, Tucker Carlson picking it up on September 15th, 2020. QAnon drops it October 7th, stop the steal. You know, the recommendation engine of Facebook, this is one of the fastest growth groups that is also given to you. And then finally, President Trump comes top down and 
you have the photo on the right, then you have January 6. This is the evolution of an information operation and how you can seed a meta narrative. I'll take you to UNESCO, and uh, this is May this year for World Press Freedom Day, the chilling. Um, it was done with Inter International Center for Journalists, University of Sheffield, and our, our team, our research team in Rappler, looking at the global trends in online violence against women journalists. Finally, all of that data that we had that on those attacks against me, uh, ICFJ took the almost half a million attacks on Facebook and you and Twitter, and they looked at what was happening globally. 73% of women journalists surveyed by ICFJ experienced online abuse. 25% received threats of physical violence. You know, the death threats, there's... Well, yeah, they become run of the mill, right? But except the danger, of course, is that online violence doesn't stay online. 20% had been attacked or abused offline in connection with the online abuse. So then we come to those half a million attacks against me. And not surprisingly, 60% of the online violence was meant to tear down my credibility. 40% was meant to tear down my spirit. You know, it was... it. it you name any animal, I've been called it. Uh, my head has been, you know, thrown into any kind of, I mean, there's so many things. I have ex uh, eczema, extremely dry skin. And the, the meme that they created was scrotum face, right? You can imagine, I'd show you the photos, but I won't have enough time. Anyway, um, so these were what they did as a, P, as a way to deal with journalists asking tough questions, you deflect. We know lots of other people who use the same type of tactics, right? You deflect. And then you, every time something is critical, you do an information operations. These are some of the things we've lived through. If you haven't read the report, it's instructional because it is happening everywhere around the world, including here. The next three slides are the evolution of our information ecosystem. This is Facebook in the Philippines. Um, the sizes of the circles, each circle is a Facebook page. Their size is based on eigenvector centrality, their ability, their power to spread a message. And you can see what, what has happened is that the government is using asymmetrical warfare against the facts, against the people. Right. So this is asymmetrical warfare. I used to follow this stuff when I was tracking terrorists. Well, this is 2018. This is 2019. Let me see if I can. Oh, well, I can't move it now. But the reason this is important is the reason why you even have a 50 50 ratio in this one is because this is the week I was first arrested. And when I was arrested, normal people shared news organizations. Right. But the information operations were trying to create alternative news websites. So unlike Alex Jones, which kind of happened under your nose here, we watch them trying to, to create it. And this is the only time, every time something bad happens to me, we kind of even it out. It's not a good way <laughs> to even it out. I want to find a better, easier way. This is 2019, right? So um Keep track of that Vogue PH because, uh, you know, later on, that key, that is one of the main pages to attack Rappler and me. This is 2020. Um, and in this one, the blue and the red circles actually are the pro-Duterte, pro-Marcos communities. But the difference here is that where they used the drug war in information operations before, now that group NTF LCAC is a new group led by a, milita a former military general who was using tactics of McCarthyism. It's like McCarthyism, essentially calling human rights activists, journalists, and opposition politicians terrorists. Um, very dangerous at a time when the government has actually passed an anti-terror law that allows you to be arrested without a warrant and held for up to 24 days, right? So this is our information ecosystem. Um, 
I'm going to wind it up by kind of showing you how geopolitical power play is connected to the data we have and how the data we have allowed us to see the connection to Russia and to China and how this is paving the way for our elections, our presidential elections, when more than 18,000 posts, 18,000 officials will be elected on May 9th, 2022. Um, December of 2018, after the Senate, the US Senate Intelligence Committee released the data from their investigation, we found the one on the left here is our information ecosystem on Facebook. That largest circle at the end is dailycentry.net, which was connected to Russian disinformation system um, through this graph that was done by New Knowledge through and, and here, this is like the irony, through an alt-right group in Canada. So you can see that there are these connections. DailyCentry.net Facebook page has since been taken down by Facebook. Um, here's China. September last year, September 2020, uh, Facebook took down information operations coming from China that was doing four things, the, the four things you see in front of you, right? The first is directly connected to you in the United States. It was using AI generated photos to create accounts for the US presidential elections. The second, it was doing China propaganda for China in the South China Sea or the West Philippine Sea issues. It was most successful in the Philippines. And what was it doing in the Philippines? It was already campaigning for the daughter of President Duterte, for president, so Sarah Duterte. And it was also polishing the image of the Marcoses. Aimee Marcos is a sister of Ferdinand Marcos Jr., Bongbong Marcos, who is now a candidate for president, right? And finally, it was attacking me and Rappler and journalists, right? Uh, May 2020, uh, the Philippine government rejected the franchise application of ABS-CBN, the largest network in the Philippines, a news group I managed for six years, the largest um, and the most extensive reach. So they, they went off the air for the first time since martial law was declared in 1972. That was the last time they had been shut down by government. So this is, this is coming from China, guys. Chinese influence operations. Here's our solution, because I'm not going to leave you with the problem. <sighs> We've now been sitting with this problem for five years. And the pillars of Rappler when we created it are three, technology, journalism, and community. Three concentric circles, those were our Venn diagrams. So our solution today is first tech. When tech creates the problem, we need to find the solutions through tech, right? Too many journalists are, are beating ourselves up, talking about trust. <laughs> it doesn't work in an information ecosystem where, you know, you have technology essentially uh, becoming a fire hose of lies. So what do we do? Well, how about an easy one? Section 230. Um, the social media platforms, these American companies are not just like phone lines, they actually automate, they use the machine to create an editorial choice, right? The fact that anger gets five times more weight than a like is a choice. And that now allows the platforms to have the toxic sludge pump through and change humanity's behavior because of the incentive that's there. So I think the first is, you know, this problem originated in the United States, find the solution. Uh, Section 230, that law that you had in place in 1996. The other thing is um, we're looking at EU, the Digital Services Act, probably the most uh, effective right now in terms of looking not downstream at the content where you run into the, all the freedom of speech questions, but upstream where you look at algorithms of bias, algorithms that prioritize the spread of lies, hate, anger, and conspiracy theories, right? Let's cut it off upstream, not here, where it becomes, you know, a choice of content. Content is the byproduct of the toxic sludge. The second is journalism, right? In the, 
sorry, the last part of technology is Rappler is building. We're building a platform um, that is rolling out. Um, part of the reason I'm also here, I was just talking to Latanya. I was like, Latanya, well, what do we do with this? So we're rolling this out. Our elevator pitch in 2011, when we were building it, uh, Rappler was, you know, we build communities of action and the food we feed our communities is journalism. So this is what the tech will do. So let's see, we're rolling it out by the end of November. So it's, it's both macro and micro, right? I think technology in the hands of journalists will behave very, very differently. Journalism, how do we help independent journalism survive? You know, uh, two, two weeks ago, was it two weeks? Um, you heard from news leaders where we talked about the, the in, essentially the International Fund for Public Interest Media, something I agreed to co-chair with Mark Thompson, the former CEO of the New York Times, while we're fixing tech and governance of tech, um, you have to help independent media survive. And while in the United States and in Europe, philanthropy is working for journalism and you know, reader revenue can work for some large news groups, in the global south, we don't have that. So IFPM, the International Fund for Public Interest Media, is going to attempt to raise the overseas development assistance of, of democratic nations from 0.3% to at least 0.5, or if we can get it to 1%, we can raise a new money of a billion dollars a year. Ah, that's one. And then, you know, for those journalists under attack, like we are in Rappler, you continue doing the journalism. In the last two weeks, we've released 10 stories that looked at an ICC, the, the affidavit, 186 pages affidavit from the International Criminal Court that is linking President Duterte who, to a hitman who claims he was ordered to kill and bury these bodies to the corruption scandal that is happening right now in the Philippines. Finally, the last pillar is community. Community is critical because I think part of the reason we can be resilient is that you need to tell people how they are being manipulated. You know, most of the time, Americans will say, ah, that doesn't happen here. And then you see how quickly democracy can collapse because one of the things that the technology has shown us, and it is both good and bad, is that humanity around the world, we actually have far more in common than we have differences. And, uh, I think you know the 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 best example for me of what it, in one sentence is the crisis we're facing was done was stated by a Harvard biologist. He studies emergent behavior of ants. E. O. Wilson. He said that the greatest crisis we're facing is our Paleolithic emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technology. Um, I'm going to leave you with this because. It's how I began, like maybe two, like 2017, I began almost every presentation with this. To the left, you know, that quote, if you can make people believe lies are the facts. This was a graphic from Al Jazeera. I am sometimes so tired of myself, you know, Sisyphus and Cassandra. <laughs> like, like I, I keep going, my gosh, we got to fix this. But that to the right is Tim Snyder, who studied the growth of you know, this fascism, and he is a historian, and he basically, you know, if you haven't read that little 150 page book on tyranny, he summarizes it here. If you want to rip the heart out of a democracy, you go after facts. That's what modern authoritarians do. This is the world we're living in. And you go back to that question, we need facts. What are you going to do? to protect the facts in your area of influence, because when you do that, you protect the truth. Thank you. I don't know, thank you very much. Uh, that was wonderful. I was uh, trying to give a clap, a clap to you, audio, audio clap so that you could hear and represent all of the sounds of all of the claps that uh, you couldn't hear. Um, 
I, you know, I have so many questions, I, but let me just ask a few. And the reason I say that, because I know others want to get in here and ask questions as well, but why don't we, so, uh, you know, you pointed out how um, inflaming news, even uh, not imp facts that aren't true, as long as they can really outrage people, generate anger and so forth, they go viral quickly. That fuels the machine of social media whose goal it is, is to keep attention all the time. Why don't, why don't, why don't we just increase the noise of, the, of facts? Um, so this is something every journalist knows. Facts are kind of boring. You know, I would love that. You know, you please, we spend our entire careers learning how to tell compelling stories. Uh, so that we can keep your interest. Now, imagine we walked into an environment where, you know, they just changed the entire playing field. You don't have to have facts. Who cares about facts? And then, and that's actually the world that we live in now. But, you know, Latanya, we were, we were talking about this. How can we do that, right? Um, in, when I was managing the, the primetime newscast of the Philippines, the, the, the top contender for that, the top rater. I always knew based on the ratings, the daily ratings, um, that crime and entertainment rated well, right? But because I'm a journalist, I'm not gonna fill that up with crime and entertainment because I'm, I would be worried about A, the news agenda, right? And B, the next generation. I wish that the tech platforms would take that into account. Um, that's the responsibility I think that journalists take that, you know, we not only want to stay there to give you what you want, I call it the sugar, we need to give you the vegetables, the news agenda. So for example, like when I was heading ABS-CBN News, I would spend 150,000 pesos to, to send a flyaway to a remote location because our public needed to learn about that conflict. There's no return on that. Ratings go down. It's expensive. When I could have just like done another entertainment story that's kind of gossip based, you don't just do that because you know you are also investing in the future of your country. So what does that mean that the, so the platforms are investing in? I mean, is it just total? I mean, they clearly have one platform. So we're all in this together around the world. We're all falling victim to the same issues. And, and so what, so you say the platform should pull back on some of the virility and have a better balanced mix of what goes viral. And clearly they can adjust those knobs if that were their goal. So what are you saying their goal is? Money. <laughs> right? I mean, this is, this we now know from the Facebook, I, Look, we knew this, of course, right? Because we could see it in the data. I lived it. Um, but, you know, really, okay, let me take the platform side. Uh, they weren't, they didn't sign up to take care of the public interest. They signed up to make money for their shareholders. So this is, you know, now we talk about all the kind of upside down incentive schemes that are that are permeating our world. And I think this is part of the reason this moment is particularly important because how much money is enough? You know, for for someone like an admin of the Philippine ad administration right now, they are using a scorched earth policy to stay in power. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that these American companies are using a scorched earth policy for money. So I, I tried in the beginning to appeal to enlightened self-interest um, because you're tearing down the future for short-term gain. And I, you know, as we can see from the, face, from the Facebook papers, um, Facebook files, uh, that doesn't really cut it, does it? <laughs> yes. So, uh... So in many ways, you, you know, you, you, you made a great point about the metaphor I would use from the United States is that the Philippines is sort of the canary in the coal mine. Um, and, you know, so as what happens to the canary tells us whether or not it's safe or not. So if you're ahead of us, we, one, we could see our, our a trajectory for the United States, but where do you see it now? Like, given the vantage point you have, where, where do you see things going in the next 
year or two? I'll talk about the Philippines and then I'll talk about the United States. In the Philippines, we have elections on May 9th, 2022. Um, uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is running for president. Uh, and he declared his candidacy 35 years after his family was ousted in a people power revolt. In, uh, and so, you know, what we have exposed have, have been the disinformation networks that are, are essentially changing history in front of our eyes. Many Filipinos now believe that, you know, Ferdinand Marcos, his father, was a hero. In fact, President Duterte allowed Ferdinand Marcos the dictator to get a hero's burial. Um, the anniversary was uh, was just yesterday, I believe. So you know, you can't have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts. Historical recidivism, res historical or so recidivism of these networks, historical revisionism, denialism. All of this is happening, and you know, again, it makes it's like we're on quicksand. But for us, right, that's what's at stake in the May, uh, in our May elections, uh, rule of law, facts. And I would say that when it comes to your elections, I don't think that that's also any different. I think aside from the Philippines, you have elections in Brazil early next year, Hungary, right? These are, as we see the world tipping, there is a lot more at stake than just little Philippines. In the United States, you guys, you heaved a sigh of relief after the election of President Biden, but you know, the underlying systems haven't changed. The only difference is that these social media companies, these the American companies care about America and they put more resources. Again, we can see this in the Facebook, papers that were just released by Francis Haugen. Um, in the, a lot of the systems they put to help protect users in America are not available in other languages. So um, they haven't changed the system. And what we are seeing is that the incentives they put in place for all of us through our cell phones, through the platform, is they're actually creating emergent behavior, not just here, but also globally of the worst of human nature, right? Remember, so I go, I went back to the atom bomb. After the atom bomb, humanity came together realizing that they could destroy everything. And so they, they vowed to kind of prevent the worst of humanity from happening. And they did. And they did some amazing new things that led to kind of the next phase of our history, the creation of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I think that's the, the moment that we live in now. Um, sorry, last, I mean, nothing has changed. Are you going to expect the platforms to come in again? Will you put your faith in their hands? Because that's essentially what you're doing. Well, listen, we, you and I, we could talk forever, but let's get a let's get a chance for others to get in and um, and and see if we have some questions. Hello, ma'am. Uh, my name is Ryan uh, Tierney. I'm a student at the the college, living in Leverett House. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Uh, this this lecture has been really interesting. Uh, however, I will say that uh, when you're kind of describing some of the threats that you've gotten. Uh, in the past regarding your journalism, it is kind of a grim reminder of how dangerous uh, the, the field of journalism is. Uh, I'm reminded of, of, of Danny Fenster, who luckily was just released uh, from prison in Myanmar, but prior to that had been sentenced to 11 years uh, for his work there. If How do you separate that part from the rest of your job? Uh, and how do you overcome that when Oftentimes, I mean, especially on in the age of social media and the internet, uh, where people can say like incredibly hurtful things and incredibly violent things uh, that they perhaps wouldn't say in person. No, thank you for your question. Um, I was all of this happened when I was old. I mean, I you know, I this is my thirty fifth year as a journalist, and so when it happened to me, 
my lines are very clear. And, you know, I, I think when I was still in college or before, I drew the line of, you know, if I'm on this side of the line, I'm good. And I cross that line, I'm evil. These are the values that we grow up with. So, you know, that's the first is I knew that if I gave up, I knew that if I stopped doing my job, that it wasn't just about me. At that point, I was already heading a news organization. And uh, and I couldn't, because if I gave up, then it's almost like my entire life, my entire career would be a lie, right? You know, because you, you need to actually live your values when it matters the most, not when it's convenient. And the true test of your values is when you stand to lose something. So yeah, I, I kind of walked into this and, um, and it isn't over, right? I'm going back to the Philippines and I will ask for permission to go to Oslo. I may or may not get permission. I am putting myself in their power because I will do my job. I have done nothing wrong. Uh, all of this is meant to intimidate me to silence or to be afraid and duck out, right? And, and this types of tactics on social media really do work. A lot more women journalists have opted out. And that's also going to be a problem in the next generation here in the United States because women are also attacked a lot more. Same with women politicians, right? Women and politicians are attacked a little differently. Um, I'll, I'll say one last thing. I know Danny Fenster. I visited Frontier Myanmar. The founder of Frontier Myanmar is a friend of mine, Sunny Shui. And Sunny, you know, when all of this was happening to me, Sunny was one of the people I spoke to because he went to jail for eight years. Um, and then as soon as he got out of jail, he started Frontier Myanmar. Uh, it, there are personal costs. You know, the question I had for him was, <laughs> you do this best over drinks, and I'm sorry, we can't have drinks together. But, you know, the question I had for him is, was it worth it? And there are weak moments where you just go, my gosh, why? Why, why does it demand this much? But even Sunny also said the same thing. Of course it is, because it's about more than you. When the cost... Look, um, oh gosh, Harvard, I think, makes me emotional. <laughs> um, um, I think that uh, the cost of not doing the right thing um, is far greater than the consequences for one person. So, you know, whether our democracy survives in the Philippines, will those chances become greater if Rappler continues doing investigative accountability journalism? And that's what we aim to do. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Samar Baja at the college. Hi, um, really a pleasure to hear from you. Um, I'm a sophomore at the college, um, calling from my dorm room, I suppose. I wish we could be in the forum together. But my question is that you speak about how technology can be part of the solution for the challenges of journalism, truth telling in our present era. And we're all Simultaneously, we're all well aware of the failures of technology-based solutions and technocracy more generally. So my question for you is, how do we ensure that technology doesn't exacerbate our existing challenges and make an already bad situation worse, especially because the technology companies feel especially nimble and weasley? I like that. I like that description. Look, the tech platforms will say, you know, tell us, create a law. Uh, and they wait for governments to do it. But the reality is that it is in the hands of the tech companies because they know better. That's also another reality, right? So as government, as these medieval institutions bump into the 21st century, you know, the immediately these tech companies can do something. And I think that that's part of what civil society should be pushing for. Um, I don't think we should be dropping out of this because it will impact all of us. It's like, and again, I use this virus of lies. It impacts us in the real world. Online violence doesn't stay online, you know, and, and some of your family members, right? Divisions in families happen because Real people are infected by this virus of lies. So um, the response I always give is that, you know, just the companies will say, well, well, we don't want to make it worse or it will make it worse. You know what? 
just because you're at a place where you can make a lot of money right now doesn't mean you shouldn't be iterating a solution. Again, something that the Facebook papers show. There could be algorithmic solutions. So, you know, they stopped weighing anger more, five, five X more. But, you know, what about something like the news ecosystem quality, a button that they can essentially, after January 6th, and this is in the reporting of Shira Frankel, New York Times reporters, where they basically said that the Facebook had a break glass action. And one of the things was to turn up a nicer news feed, meaning when they turned this up, the algorithms chose to spread facts. So it, in Crowd Tangle, they then showed the top 10 included CNN, New York Times, NPR, um, but, you know, Facebook changed it soon because the engagement was much lower. This is something news organizations know, you know. Um, again, it's like, well, are you going to just put in crap? I mean, new entertainment or sorry, not to say entertainment is crap, but I mean, you know, are you just going to put in the sugar without the vegetables? And I think that turning up news ecosystem quality, that's also an, an algorithmic thing. It's not a free speech issue. So there are things that we can demand immediately. Um, I think we need to demand it now. Thank you. Um, next is Max from the college. Hello, Madam Ressa. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And thank you very much for your service um, that you worked as to, to all of us, really. Um, I'm a student at the college. I was very struck in your in your presentation by the um, by the slide on how early the stop the steal um, meta narrative unfolded in in August 2019 already, um, and I was wondering, can you talk to us about what determines whether one particular conspiracy theory will proliferate in those networks above others? Um, is it truly only a function of salience and how outrageous the theory is, or is it more complicated? And are there perhaps political interests behind it that guide that? And if they do, to what extent? Can they control which narrative above others will become the dominant one? No, thank you for your question. And that is something I'm sure that, you know, this, we can do a whole class on this because in the end, it's an information operation. Um, too often, the public di discourse on this focuses on just the content itself, right? So how, what determines a meta narrative? or and virality, right? So the platform sometimes will only look at virality and they'll cut the virality. Yes, that's one. But when a meta narrative is seeded and then pounded at different times, right? And I mean, pounded can be using bots and fake accounts or using real people organized because now uh, just this year, Facebook has policies out finally for brigading, which is, before you've heard about CIB, coordinated inauthentic behavior, but what if they're authentic harms, right? What if it is an information operations? An example in the Philippines is when the police and military pages, because Facebook will give a little bit more oomph to government pages because of coronavirus, even that, think about that, right? If you're in a country like mine, um, they, they ratchet up the, the government pages, which includes police and military pages. And so when they attack a human rights activist, that poor activist, I, I can send some links here uh, or I'll send it to, to Shornstein to send to you, you know, because what we did is we, we showed the study and we showed how the activists and one particular group, Karapatan, had had 16 people killed during the last five years. Right. So um, information operations, think about it like military warfare, which is exactly why it is part of the Russian military doctrine. In the old days, you would call it psyops, you know, and, and many countries had this, including the United States. But at this scale, the ability to literally change our reality. I, I always use this thing of I don't know if you remember the movie. Um, the one with Leonardo DiCaprio, where they will go into the dream world to change reality. Inception. Inception, right. Yeah. That's that's what social media has, has become. Anyway, so um, how do you make a meta narrative st stick? In something like that, it's seeded and it stays dormant. And, you know, 
the platform will never know about it but then over time it is it's it's tapped and then the virality happens at a different time information operations is like gaining um what's the right word credibility knowing the signals that the algorithms will pick up and over time building it up right so again QAnon is an easy one. How did those groups grow so fast? Um, what are the problems of engagement, the way these platforms define it? I mean, you know, we used to read those books where, you know, the wisdom of crowds turns into a mob. So essentially, that's what we're doing. So whether it is coordinated inauthentic behavior or coordinated, authentic behavior that leads to online harms. These are all insidious manipulation. And here's where you go to the rest of the technology. Um, everything you do, every post you, you make is pulled together by machine learning and they create a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself. And the question is, does the platform own that or do you? Should you be giving permission for the platforms to take that from you? Because it's kind of like you went to a psychologist and the psychologist then said, hey, I got his deepest secrets. Who will pay me for it? Right. That's kind of what this machine learning and then artificial intelligence will come in and then serve it up in that ad. It, this new ad world is also diff very different from the ad world. Uh, that I grew up in, in broadcast journalism. You know, it is not micro-targeted. I cannot um, show different people on, on our Zoom call different versions of reality uh, because I want to manipulate you. So think about it like that. Like these things that were used for marketing are now used by geopolitical power to manipulate you. Thank you. That's very insightful. And, Thank you. And the last question will be from Jay from the college. Hi, my name is Rasa. Thank you so much for the talk. It was very informative. Um, I have um, one question split into two parts. Right? The first question would just be, I'm from Singapore, um, and from where I'm from, the political system is such that, you know, news information can be considered reliable, but at the same time, very restrictive. How do you reconcile that when, I believe when you talked about trust, but trust being the withholding of information, the creating of information, specifically because Singapore has a fake news law, it's been talked about a lot. So that's part one. Part two, a uh, more trivial question. I saw that um, on Rappler, um, there's a mood meter. Um, over the past years that you've implemented it, any kind of um, particularly insightful uh, analysis uh, you may have from that? Uh, and thank you so much. Um, the mood meter. So first, I think Singapore is unique. And um, it's unique because uh, when Lee Kuan Yew took over, he took a backwater and he, it, it, he really was the architect of Singapore, right? And you, uh, I watched it grow. I covered Singapore. My first story out of Singapore was the caning of Michael Fay, where it was the clash of East and West, you know, and I learned to both admire Singapore and also be a little scared of it. But, you know, the kind of planning that Singapore government encourages uh, is incredible. I, you know, the very first um, environmental plan programs were put in place by Singapore. Uh, 90, 86, I think when I started covering was 86%, now 90%, more than 90% of Singaporeans live in public housing, right? So now I sound like the ad for Singapore. So let me put it this way. The PAP has been in power forever uh, in Singapore. Uh, and it's, tough to be opposition in Singapore. And what and, and the 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 kind of the dream of PAP is to have the opposition inside, right? So ah, that's a long way of saying um, Singapore is not the rest of the world, you know, because I ask this of myself, if my government was that efficient, would I give up some rights? If the government was that, so the, to those who aren't from Singapore, the government, and this is now changing, but the government has in place 10-year plans. And these 10-year plans are taken up by the government, by the new officials coming in, and they're evolved. Um, I, I wrote my second book from RISJ, from the National at NTU, so from, from Singapore. And I learned a ton about it, not just from covering it, but also from, uh, from living there. So it's hard when I come from countries like the Philippines, a decade in Indonesia. Um, I also yearn for order 
and stability and trust. So the question is for your generation, Jay, because you come from a different culture, what do you want? And how much freedom are you willing to give up to have a sense of stability and order? I think that's the same in every country that you have. And you know, certainly we're not running after Singapore for human rights violations. I mean, even Bill Clinton and the caning of Michael Fay couldn't really say that, right? So these are, I think those are the things. So that's an easy one. The, the mood meter, you can see I have no easy answer for you. Um, the fake news law of Singapore. Singapore sits, is one of the 21 countries in the International Grand Committee on Disinformation. And I've addressed some of the ministers of Singapore there. Most recently, Francis Haugen and I testified. And I'll tell you the questions from the two, the two representatives of Singapore in that committee focused on online violence against women. You know, I love the thinking slow process um, because it counters the thinking fast, uh, manipulative content of social media or, or makeup. Um, on the mood meter, the mood meter was essentially something we created because of a BlackBerry experiment in Harvard in 2011, when 100 students were given BlackBerries. And based on that, they were able, the, the, the researchers were able to find um, a virus, like, not, sorry, not a virus, but flu, right? How, the fe how fever spread through this. They were able to look at mobility, where the places of, where the kids partied. Um, that gave me a lot of ideas about what we can do if we can track mood with stories, like what emotions, it isn't a, a, a scientific study of any sort. It's a thinking fast and easy engagement. That was the idea behind the mood meter. Since then though, what we've done is working with our academic partners in the Philippines, we were able to then show how certain stories impacted different parts of the Philippines. And here's the other part. The other reason why I know that we're being manipulated is because from 2012, when we began the mood meter until 2016, when Rodrigo Duterte won office, the predominant emotion in the mood meter was happiness, happy, happy, always happy, inspired. Filipinos were happy. And then after 2016, Anger, which was number two or number three at best in the past years, because we quantified that, um, became number one overwhelmingly. So I don't think people's values and cultures change overnight. That's what I think is the algorithmic thumb on the scale of these American platforms. Well, I want to thank you. Um, let me start first of all, uh, also by thanking our host. Uh, the Institute of Politics, we thank the Center for Public Leadership, we thank the Shorenstein Center, and Maria Ressa, we really thank you for a wonderful time. It's always enjoyable to talk with you. And then finally, I want to thank all of you participants who came on to Zoom uh, and, and really heard her message and asked your questions and participated. Thank you.